In today's show, we're looking at buy low and sell high players, overperforming and underperforming players, guys that you might want to get rid of, guys that you might want to acquire. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball and on TikTok at redrock underscore beeble as well. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. So we're going to talk buy lows and sell highs. We're going to give a blanket disclaimer, I will. This is not an exhaustive list. Hey, but isn't this guy a buy low? Well, he wasn't on Josh's show, so he's definitely not a sell high. Nah, that's not how it works. I'm going to do five buy lows. I'm going to do five sell highs. Yes, you might want to buy low on Kyrie Irving. You might want to buy low on Kawhi Leonard. You might want to sell high on OG Ananobi. These are names who are not included on this show. This is not an exhaustive list. Well, Jabari Smith's not on the show. Therefore, Josh must think he sucks and will continue to be outside the top 200. Not true. I just did Jabari Smith, and we'll talk about him a little bit in a sec. Um, But this is not an exhaustive list. So if your player that you think is a buy low or sell high isn't on the show, it does not mean that they are not that. I am not the arbiter of who is a buy low or who is a sell high. Drop them in the comments below. You can tweet them at me, and I can go ahead and, and give you my thoughts on individual players if you have someone that's not included in this show. But this is not exhaustive. This is five guys on each side of the ledger that I'm going to talk about in this show. So I guess after that little uh, discussion disclaimer, warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We're going to start all of these buy low, sell high shows by looking at how we did. And we're going to give these things two weeks to percolate. Last week we did it. I think it was a perfect result in terms of whether we hit the buy lows or sell highs right. Maybe there was one that was off. We weren't quite as good with this one. This is recapping the week th- week three show. But let's have a look. The first five, if you're watching this on YouTube, the first five on this list are the, were the buy lows. The bottom five were the sell highs. I had Demontis Sabonis, who was 64th at the time, said he was a buy low. Since that show, the buy low bump hit him, and he's 23rd. He was a guy that I was looking at probably mid third round, maybe early third round in certain circumstances, and he really disappointed to start, but he's cranking now, and uh, the numbers are pretty strong. Jared Allen was 89th when we did this show. He was a buy low. He's now 37th. Now, the uh, ankle issue is a little bit worrying. Missed a couple of games now. I think he's going to miss today's game, Um, but otherwise, the per game production has jumped back up. This one was wrong. Still maintained that he can be a buy low, and that's Benny Simmons, but my faith is uh, pretty limited. I think he is back today. I don't know what role he's going to play. 15 minute a night backup center, 30 minute a night starting forward. I have absolutely no idea. And I don't actually think we're going to get a full idea on Simmons until at least Kyrie is back to work out what's going to happen. But he was 134th. And I said, yeah, I think he can be better than that. And he's been worse. 181st. Yuck. I've just, yeah, I, I didn't see Ben Simmons 15 minute a night backup center with sore knees on my bingo card. Didn't see it coming. So that was a uh, that was an L. There's also an L on um, Jabari Smith, who I did reference just before. Ah, Smitty. He was 151st and went, ah, oh, it's going to get better. Ah, no, no, it didn't. 266th. Now, in saying that, over the last couple of games, he has improved. Now, the usage is still piss poor. The shooting percentages are still bad, but he's got the rebounds back. The defensive stats are coming in. And I still do, even though he's not going to be featured on this show, I still do believe that Jabari Smith's a 12-team league guy and he's a buy low player. It just got worse since the last time I did it. Filipino legend Jalen Green. Well, that was one that I, that I nailed. He was 176th at the time. And again, I had pushback. Man, he's, he's bad. He's, he's actually going to get worse. Some people told me. Yeah, right. So he went from 176th to 29th. Now that borders on sell high. But there was always top 40 upside for Green this season. Getting there was hard. But what he has done is shown an ability to create. And that was the missing factor to me. Would he be a 25, 3, and 3 guy? Or could he be 25, 4, and 5? Because that's a big difference. You know, tie in with efficiency. He's been really good. My sell highs. Donovan Mitchell. I guess technically it's a win. 
Don was fifth last time we did that two weeks ago. He's Don. He's good. And in the two weeks after that, he's sixth. It's not a big change, is it? Now, Garland has been sort of in and out dealing with that knee injury. Mitchell's been in and out with the ankle injury. So we haven't really seen those two play together a huge amount. Still think that Mitchell is not going to be a top 10 player rest of the season. So maybe there's still a little bit of sell high available there for him. This one here was relatively obvious, I thought, and I was pretty strong on it. Jonas Vasu Inuansas. He was 34th in those two weeks leading up to week three. He's 157th since then. Larry Nance is eating his minutes. He's basically playing as a reserve, but starting. The 157th, he can be marginally better than that, but I don't think he's sniffing top 50. I don't think he's sniffing top 70. He was a guy I think I had in the 80s of drafts, and I think I might have been too high on it. Keldon Johnson, he was 37th. Since then, he's 122nd. What he was basing, or what that rank was was coming to fruition through was big shooting percentages, and they fell away. And Johnson's not always been a guy that's had great peripherals. He's, they've been pretty good this season, but he fell away. 122 makes him a little bit of a buy low. Dennis Smith was 48th. He's now 137th, and he's now a clear drop. I hope you sold him for anything, any top 80 player. You have to do it. Like, it was not going to last. And even before the return of the Mallow ball, it started to fall. Rogier back, ball back, Haywood will come back. And Smith has no use there. And Kevin Herter was at 61. He's 110th since then. The elite shooting, he's still a good shooter. But as I, as I will constantly preach, 50% versus 40%, still, both of those numbers, very, very good. It's a big difference in your overall value. And that's what happened to Fanta Pants. Fanta Pants right there. Is he just copped that, um, cop that hit of that shooting regressing, which we did expect was going to happen. Today's episode is brought to you by a new sponsor, Turo. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. You can browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the US, the UK, Canada, and coming soon to Australia. Book a spacious SUV or a minivan for a family road trip, get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday or holiday, or find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from A to B. Test drive that new electric vehicle you've had your eye on to see how it fits in your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms and conditions and exclusions apply. Forget boarding rental cars and find your drive at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. You sponsor. Good to have those guys here. Today's episode is also brought to you. Hold on to everything. It's Built Bar. Built Bar's back and their ad read is actually crazy. I don't know what's going on. Can we pause the pod for a second? Okay, we're paused. Don't pause. Please don't pause the podcast. What are you talking about, Built Bar? It's like they've written this and they're trying to get me to rap or something. Great, because you got to try this. I'm talking about Built Bar's new reimagined flavors. Are you guys all right? Cookie dough topper. Coconut brownie bar. Coconut brownie topper. What's a topper? I'm sure it'll tell me if I read down. White chocolate peppermint granola. It's Bilt's take on the granola bar. It's more filling and still insanely tasty. And candy cane brownie puff. Bilt puffs are built like biting into the universe's most delicious cloud. Was the person writing this on LSD? What is happening on this ad read? Bilt Bar is revolutionizing nutrition as we know it with 100% real chocolate, 17 grams of protein, and shockingly low sugar and calories. 130 calories. I'm not kidding. There will be a time in your life, and you, you, this will be the new calendar. Instead of like BC and AC, or AD or whatever. I can't remember. What's the AD? Yeah, AD. It'll be before Bilt Bar New Flavors or after Bilt Bar New Flavors. ABBF. Yeah, there you go. So one ABBF. That's how good these flavors are. Go go get your built bars. Go to built.com. Use the code locked on15 at built.com to get 15% off your order. That ad read was crazy, but built bar is crazy delicious. Oh yeah. All right, let's off <laughs> so I'm like, that's that ad read made me lose my mind. Let's talk about the buy lows now. Are you glad the built bar's back? I'm not sure I am. No, they're great. I'll actually I actually do really love built bar. I've got a built bar wrapper here for those of you. There you go. That I had this morning, built bar. Far out. Let's uh, talk by lows. Josh the Hitman Hart. He's undeniable that Josh the Hitman Hart is struggling. 
He's over the last two weeks, the 250th ranked player in category leagues, 112th in points leagues. Now, I've tried to do things a little bit different on the graphical display here, just to show you some different things. At the moment, over the last two weeks, he's averaging 26 fantasy points. For the season, he's at 28. That's not a huge difference, but two points is two points. How is this changing for Josh Hart? Well, I thought I'd do some comparisons as to what he's shooting versus where it was last season, or in some cases, where it is this year. He, over the last two weeks, is shooting 32% from the field. Last season, 50%. Like, we all know 32% is very low, but this is not a 40% shooter. This is a guy who has gotten by on extraordinarily high field goal percentage numbers. He's, he's hitting 34% of his twos. He hit 60% last season. If you don't see, like, that's why oh, I'm going to drop Hart. Josh Hart is struggling. It's just not going to stick like this. It just isn't. He's hitting 56% of his free throws over the last seven games. He was at 76 last year, 78 the year before that, 74 the year before that. Has he Westbrooked? Has he McCullumed? Is he just shit at free throws now? Even if he is, that 56 should at least push up to 68 or 69. He's at 68 for the season. So just those two things there, push them back up, and you're already back in the top 100. Like that's that's it. That, that I don't. I have no more arguments for Josh Hart. He will not be a guy whose true shooting is 40.6% over the last six games, seven games. He won't be. Like I, I stake nothing on it, but I stake this empty built bar wrapper on it. He won't be. It is going, he's going to improve. His role is not changing. He's averaging 37 minutes a night, eight rebounds, five assists, and a steal. And that shooting will come up. And we know when shooting comes up, scoring comes up. It all adds in. He's going to get better. Believe. Believe in the hitman. Paul Washington Jr. You're going to get a good thing. Part of what I do on this show is not to just rant or tell you what to do. I'm very anti trying to tell you what to do, unless it's drop DeAndre Hunter. I'm very anti trying to tell you what to do. Right? I'm trying to explain what I would do what I think people should do, but also why I think it should happen and how we can view into this. And one of the big things with buy lows and sell highs is like, is this guy struggling? Look at what the shooting numbers are. That is what changes. That is the big influences. Is there something weirdly outlying? And people don't always look at it. They go, well, look, he's killing me in field goal percentage. Well, have a look. Is it because the threes aren't going in? Is it because he's hitting half of the two-pointers he normally does? Is he weirdly not getting to the line or getting to the line tons more and missing them all? Is it one outlier game? All these things influence, but we don't look at it. We look at the macro. We look at fantasy points. Oh, man, he only gave me 20. He normally gives me 35. He's shit. I'm going to drop him. Eh. There's reasons behind all this stuff. P, P, I was going to say P. Washington Jr. P.J. Washington Jr. 217th over the last two weeks. 137th in points leagues. He's averaging 23.5 fantasy points versus almost 26 over the course of the season. So there you go. We're looking at almost two and a half fantasy points difference over the last two weeks. So a big drop. So what's happening? Well, you're going to be shocked to know he just isn't shooting well. 23% from three. for the Last season, 37%. Even if he's not a 37% shooter this season, and he might not be, pretty sure he's not going to be a 23% three-point shooter. At the moment for the year, he's at 32%. So there's actually room for him to get better for the overall course of the season. His two-point percentage last season, 60%. This season or last two weeks, 47. Now, I will couch that by saying two years ago, he hit just 48% from two. So maybe the 60 is the outlier. But 47% from two is an extraordinarily low number. And for the year, he's at 49. So there's at least you know 2.5% to go up here to get back to season averages. And then there's like 11 percentage points to get back to last year's numbers. And we all know that's going to change a ton. His rebound numbers are also down. He's at 5.2 rebounds per 36 over the last eight games. He was at 6.9 last season. Now, part of that is that he did play um, a lot more center last year, and he's not really doing that. So while that might not come back, I expect him to get higher than the 4.6 that he's averaging. Yeah, maybe 5, maybe 5.1. Because the minutes are up from last year, 27 to 31, but he's averaging fewer rebounds this season. And as you can tell by the differences in the rebound rate. Let's go to Detroit. My name is Richie Cunningham. There is no doubt that Cade Cunningham is struggling recently. Absolutely no doubt. Over the last two weeks, 
Cadis is 195th over the last two weeks, 94th in points leagues. Now, for all of the struggle, all of the hand-wringing, he's still 71st for the season. Right? So it's it's been bad, but it's not that bad. 29 fantasy points for the year. He's at 37. All right. You can tell that this is a gigantic drop-off. And obviously, he's injured at the moment, which is frustrating. So what's changing here? Last season, he ended the year really strongly with his shooting. He still only shot 31% from three, and somehow that's way down. Last four games, 24%. Again, we look at it and we go, I know he's struggling. Oh, he's killing me in field goals. Do you honestly believe that Cade Cunningham will remain a 24% three-point shooter? That is the question that despite any reactivity that you have or any jumping to conclusions or any you know, hot-headedness, we go, oh, fuck this guy, he's gone. So he's shit, he's a pass. He's get rid of him, get rid of him. Go, okay, is he actually a 24% three-point shooter? And the logic brain goes, of course he isn't. Like, he's not. And we look at him shooting 31% last year. Well, that could easily jump five percentage points from there to 36. And that makes him an average three-point shooter. So that puts you 12 percentage points above what he's done the last four. He's also hitting 38% from two. I think Cade can become a 50-51% two-point shooter. There is so much scope for him to improve as a shooter this season. Like, there's so much. Also, his steals, where are they? He's at 0.5 over the last four games. He had two steals in four games. Last season... He averaged 1.2. So while it seems dire, while it seems bad, because it is bad, the last two weeks have been bad, and now he's injured, these are things that are going to just correct very easily. I don't have any concern about Cade pushing back up, and I still think he's going to be a top 50 player, despite these struggles. I don't really have too much concern there. Let's go to cousin Kevin Porter, who's 194th over the last two weeks. He's 71st in points leagues. His points league numbers, thirty almost 32 fantasy points over the last two weeks versus almost 36 for the season. So we can see a bit of a discrepancy there. In category leagues, he's 194th, as I said. What's changing here? Well, the big thing we look at with Porter is free throw percentage. It's been really good, and now it's shit house. He is at 62% on six attempts over the last six games, which is such a giant impact that it's killing you. It's killing his numbers. He's a negative 2.85 on free throw percentage. His field goals are also bad, 40%. That's a negative 1.94 Z score. That's that's it. That's the big negative. Now, he's never going to be, I don't think, a good field goal percentage player. But the free throws is the weird, not the weird thing. He's at 73.2% for the season. It wasn't like 78 for a stretch until like the last six games or something, five games, where it's dropped off. Last season, we look at it and go, well, he's only 64% last season. And, and that's true. But the year before that, he was 73. And the year before that, he was 72. So, you know, which one is it? Because it's a big difference. 67% is trash on that volume. 73% is trash adjacent. It's mildly trash. It's recyclable garbage. It's not as absolute killer. It's not as punt free throw. It's still He still is probably punt free throw. But there is so much room for him to improve over the last six games. 48% from two, 30% from three, 62% from the line, true shooting of 50. He was 50. He's been true shooting 53 the last three seasons. So despite these struggles, I think there's clear bump up ability here for what Porter's doing. His assists are fine, his steals are fine, his rebounds are fine, his three point volume is fine. He's hitting 30% of his threes. Last season he hit 38. He was a really good. He was the Rockets' best three-point shooter last season, but it's way off. I am expecting a bounce back for him. Let's go to the last buy low. It's Trey Young. Trey Young, sixty-eighth in category leagues over the last two weeks, twenty-fourth in points leagues. His points leagues numbers: forty-two versus forty-four over the course of the season. We talked about Trey Young a lot in the off-season, and we said, yes, I, I think he's a first-round player, but. What we need to look at is he had this really, really good season last year where he was excellent. No one was picking him in the first round last season. And then he stepped way up. And it was because the three-point shooting went from average, which literally he had been an average three-point shooter in his career, and he took it to 38%. Well, this season, it's fallen back off. He was at 38 last season. Over the last six games, 29% from three. Last season, 51% from two. The last six games, 39% from two. Like they're horrendous numbers. 
His rebounds was at 3.7 or were at 3.7 last season. They're at three this year. Now, I'm not sure that changes because DeJounte has taken the rebound. So that might not change. But I do not believe that Trey Young is a 48% true shooting guy, which is taking into consideration the piss poor threes, the piss poor twos. He, he, for the season, he's at 51. Now, despite last season being an outlier season, his last three years in true shooting have been 60, 59, and 60. He is at 51. There is so much improvement coming, I think, from Trey. And his usage is high. It's higher than last season. This could re- He could really blow up. I still think he's a first-round player, barely. I, in, yeah, at worst, at worst, top 20. There is, if you can get him, and I haven't talked about this much with these other guys, but I've talked about sort of ranges on them in terms of where you trade for. And maybe I should have talked more about that. Maybe I'll go, go through that in a second. Um, but if you can get him for a top 30 player, Trey Young, I absolutely do that. I'll, I'll talk about the others now. I probably should have. Josh Hart, look, if someone drops him, you add him, you, you throw your worst player there. PJ Washington, your worst two players, get him in a trade. Cade Cunningham, a top 60 player. Oh, actually, a top 70 player I would trade. He's injured at the moment. You might not even have to do that. A top 70 player should get it done. Kevin Porter Jr., um, a top... That's a hard one because the people who have him are punting free throws, and you probably need to as well. But, you know, a top 100 player I would get for him and be pretty comfortable with it. And Trey Young, as I said, top 30 player, you smash that through. Really happy with that. Today's episode is also brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source, number one. Number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. After the Philadelphia Eagles became the NFL's last... Yeah, they, they were the last team to, to lose a game, weren't they? As they lost to the Commanders yesterday. So, what were the odds in the Miami Dolphins, the 1972 Miami Dolphins popping champagne? Would have to have been pretty low. And there they are. They've done it. No more undefeated teams in the NFL. Can the Eagles bounce back next week against... Jeff Saturday's Indianapolis Colts. They're six and a half point favorites over at betonline.net. And you can check that out. Find the latest odds and trends for all professional and amateur leagues out there. Football, basketball, soccer, esports. We've got it all at betonline.net. We're the fastest and easiest way to help you get your betting fix. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline is where the game starts. Don't forget to gamble responsibly. Let's do sell highs. Spencer Dinwiddie. Yeah, this one should be obvious. He's 18th over the last two weeks, 35th over the uh, for points leagues over the last two weeks. How is it happening? Dinwiddie is 45th for the year in category leagues. What is actually happening here? He's Look, he's averaging 38 fantasy points versus 32 for the year. So it's a big jump. He's hitting 46% of his threes. There's your red flag number one. He hit 34% last season. And even if we go, all right, he's improved. He's better. He's a 37%, 38% guy. This is coming down. This is coming down the 46. He's hitting 93% of his free throws. Last season, 77. The last full season before that, 78. Is he all of a sudden the best free throw shooter in the NBA? I'll say no. I'll say he isn't. And I say he goes back to 78 or 80. And I say that the three-point shooting goes back from 46, which is actually he's at 46 for the entire season, and it falls back to 38 or to 40. And that loses all the value. He's also, he's doing so many things together. Over the last six games, 1.5 steals. Last season, 0.7. So you doubled your steal rate. You've gone 12 percentage points higher on threes and 16 percentage points higher on free throws. Yeah, that regression is going to smack you in the face. It's going to turkey slap you real hard. And you are going to lose a lot. So, I've got him as a barely top 100 player in categories, even though he's 45th for the season. And 18th over the last two weeks. And 7th over the last week. If you can get... If you can trade away Spencer Dinwiddie and get any top 50 player, I would do it. Package Spencer and someone else and get Trey Young. Like... This is not going to stick. It's got, even if you go, he's playing with Luca and his rolls up and his minutes are up. And I agree with all that. This other stuff won't stick. It, it can't. I can't see how Spencer Dinwiddie becomes, it doubles his steal rate and becomes the best NBA free throw shooter in the NBA, as well as the best three point shooter in the NBA. It's not realistic. It's just not going to happen. Come back in two weeks and find that I was wrong. And he's now the 10th best player. Let's go to other, another guy who's a sell high, big Jez Grant in Portland. Over the last two weeks, he's 19th. 
in categories and 32nd in points leagues. He's averaging almost 40 fantasy points, and his season numbers are a little bit under 33. He has been ludicrous over this time. Now, the minutes are way up, 37 minutes over the last six games. He's hitting 50% of his threes. Well, there you go. That's not happening. He's at 36, he hit 36% last season. He's hitting 53% of his twos. He's at 47% last season. Now, I will grant Jeremy Grant this. Didn't mean to use that pun, but there you go. It works. In Detroit, he hit 47 and 47% of twos because he was put into a role where he wasn't suited to it. The last time he was in the role he was suited to in Denver in 1920, he hit 54% of his twos. So there is a potential that that 50 plus percent two-point percentage sticks. That is distinctly possible. Being a 50% three-point shooter or even a 46% three-point shooter has no chance of sticking. There is just no way. Also, over the last six games, he has a usage of 27%. Lillard was out of some of those games. Simons was out of some of those games. Grant got hot in some of those games. He's a 23% usage guy over the course of the season. I do not believe for a single second that Jeremy Grant will run at a usage rate higher than the usage rate he had in Detroit last season. I don't believe that'll happen. Grant is 64th for the season. I think he's probably more in the 80 to 100 range, rest of season. Um, And I just don't think that this level of production or shooting or usage has any chance of being able to maintain. So if you get a top 50 player for Jeremy Grant, you you absolutely do it. Even a top 60 guy, I'd be inclined to do what I think. Let's go to the Thick Hogsman. Um, I think I am a TH. T to the H. Yeah, TH for life. 51st ranked player in category leagues over the last two weeks. Tobias Harris, 55th in points leagues. I was massively out on Toby in the preseason. I had him in like the 90s. And I just had no interest in drafting him. Therefore, I don't have him on any teams. And the last two weeks, he's been really, really good. There's absolutely no denying that. The ranking numbers are strong. He's averaging 34 fantasy points over the last two weeks. He's at 30, under 32 for the year, so he's two points higher. But we know there's a couple of factors here. James Harden is out, and that's meaning more usage goes to Harris. He's at 21 usage over the last six games, but he's under, at under 19 last se- uh, for the season. Like His usage over the last two weeks is exactly the same as his usage, usage last season. And remember... The Harden factor is big here. That is what's impacting Harris having that usage. But it's not just that. One thing that is interesting is is 34% of his shots are from three. Last season, only 27%. So he's moving into more of a spot-up role. Now, he's getting more of those shots because Harden is out, but he's taking more threes. That is helping him. He is hitting more threes. That is providing more value and more scoring for him. And the threes are going in at a a solid rate, 38%. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what he will do. But the other thing is, is steals. Steals are variable. They vary a lot and they impact fantasy numbers a ton. He averaged 0.6 steals last season. He averaged 0.9 the year before that. He averaged 0.7 the year before that. He's at 1.6 this season and 1.5 over the last two weeks. I just find it very hard to believe that Tobias Harris is going to go from a putrid steals generator to one of the best in the NBA. It seems unlikely to me. So if I could get any top 70 player back in a trade for Tobias Harris, understand that usage will drop and that steal rate at some point, I, I'm pretty sure, is going to level off, I would do it. The Winter Soldier, Max Struess, 75th over the last two weeks, 120th in points leagues. He's averaging 25 fantasy points over the last two weeks versus 24 and a half. That's not that big of a, a, a difference, but in category leagues, it is. So what's happening here with Struess? Well, it's pretty obvious, I think. Tyler Hero's out. So Struess is playing more. Victor Oladipo is out. So Struess is playing more. He's starting these games. And he's doing that thing, the double whammy we like to talk about. right? He's hitting more shots in a larger role. So you're getting the extra minutes, the extra usage, and the shots are going in more. Sometimes you play the extra minutes and the shots don't win as much, so it balances out. But when you do the double, it makes things look way better. He's averaging 35 minutes a night in the last seven games, but as a reserve this year, it's only 31. So be aware of that when Hero returns and then Oladipo is going to cut in as well a little bit. He's hitting 65% of his twos. He hit 56 last season. So there's going to be a drop off there. He also, in the last seven games, hasn't missed a free throw. Last season, he was at 79% from the line. 
Now he can he can easily be an 83, 84% guy, no problem. But 100%, it's going to drop. To me, he's a guy that's still going to be, when all is said and done, a fringe 12-team league player who provides value in threes. That is by far his best category. In his second best category, it's free throws. And that's because he's hitting 100% of them. And that's not going to stay. So realistically, he's a threes streamer who's providing a nice marginal average production in points that is fueled by the extra three to four minutes that he's getting a game because of absences to other players. If you can get any top 100 player for Max Struess, I would take it in a heartbeat. You probably can't, but I would do that. And let's go to the last guy on this list. Hello. Lonnie Walker. He's 91st in category leagues over the last two weeks, 130th in points leagues. Averaging, the interesting thing with him is, is despite yeah, playing well, and we'll talk about some of the numbers, why he's playing well, he's actually averaging fewer fantasy points than his season average. So in points leagues, this one probably doesn't apply to you as much. In category leagues, he does. Over the last five games, Walker is shooting 54% from three. For reference, he hit 31% last season. For the year, he's at 36%. But he is on an absolutely red-hot tear over these last five games, and it's just juicing his numbers. He's made threes up from 1.8 to 2.6. His scoring is up from 19 to 16.4. And the difference between 19 and 6.4 is basically one made three. So if the threes fall back to 34%, then the scoring falls back to 16 points, and Lonnie Walker falls back to not being a top 100 player. He's also hitting free throws at 86% over the last five games. Last season, he was at 78. Let's give him benefit of the doubt and say he's an 80% guy, which is what he's been all season. That's another point maybe off, half a point off. And he's hitting two-pointers at 54%. Now, his two-point rate has been strong all season. Around 55%. His last three years in San Antonio, 49, 48, 43%. Has he become a better shooter? I'll grant him. Maybe he is a better two-point converter. I won't grant him the fact that he's a 54% three-point shooter. And the last couple of games, no LeBron. There's still a potential of an arrival of Buddy Heald, maybe, and a lack of role. I don't think that Walker, like Struess, is going to remain a must-roster 12-team league player. I think he can be a solid enough scoring option, but I have little faith that this his overall season true shooting at 57% and at 67% over the last two weeks, I have little faith that he is going to maintain that given how absolutely below average he's been in every facet of his career prior to this season. Am I a Lonnie Walker hater? Absolutely not. I think he's a good bloke, but I'm just going based on everything I've seen over the last 200 games that he's played versus the 11 that he's played this season or the five that he's played over the last two weeks to believe that there's been that significant of a change. There is going to be a regression, I'm pretty sure. And if I could get any top 100 player, top 110 player for Lonnie, I would do it in a heartbeat. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget, drop some comments below. Which ones am I crazy on? Josh, no way! Max Struess is going to continue this. Lonnie Walker's a legend. He's a bag man. He's got the pull-up hezzy jimbo or whatever bullshit you want to say. Drop it in the comments. Let's go. Let's talk about it. Put those comments below. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey. Tell me how much you love the Built Bar ad and their toppers or whatever that is. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.